two hours before the wedding is supposed to begin, Veronica has reached her breaking point. I've given up. Veronica's really losing her mind. She's a little scared about the wedding. Put your clothes on, uh, your dress on. I can't so put I my can. dress on, Mom. Yes, you can. No, I can't. The photographer. Well, you need to remove that face. And I gotta remove my face. The wedding is the most miserable day of my life right now. Nothing has been happy. I'm losing my marbles. Is that me? Has he found the rings? Hold on, what do you mean, has he found the rings? Are the rings missing? At Linda's parents' house, things have gone from bad to worse. His shoes aren't even staying on. The straps on the bridesmaid's shoes that James bought don't fit. For Linda, it's the final straw. Been booing. <laughs> He's just not organized anything. <laughs> Can you just do that a minute? Do we still have the bling tufted bar? I don't know about that. I'm working no. on that. But Seriously? it's okay because I, no. I want, wait, wait, wait. I want to save the crystal one for the lounge. Apparently, my wedding planner tells me that my dad's vetoed some of my fantastic furniture and it's being replaced by some less fantastic furniture. Are there two bars in the ballroom? In the ballroom. If, and if I don't have the tufted <laughs> ones, they have white ones that are brand new at Bacara. They're not tufted, no. but it's okay, because we're having your new. I Let don't me play with it. want that, because Alex. And trying to create a balance between what she wants and, and not breaking their bank, because otherwise we have to trade out some of the furniture. No. What I intend to do about this is complain so much to my wedding planner, she forces my dad to succumb to whatever her demands are. I'm not going to give up on my tufted crystal furniture dreams. Not happening. Has anyone even seen Mark's shoes yet? I don't think so. Well, can you find out? Okay. We have to go. But surely something as minor as Mark's footwear won't make or break our Zilla's dream day. Where are Mark's shoes, man? Uh, no! He's not wearing these shoes! Joe! 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 We stand corrected. He's not walking down the aisle in these shoes! Who said these shoes are okay? Give me my phone! I need to call him! He's not wearing those! Okay, everybody take a deep breath. We're just talking about shoes, right? Are you kidding me? What did I do? You brought these black shoes in here. You're not wearing this to the wedding. I do premarital counseling. <laughs> and one of the things I tell people who go through premarital counseling is, uh, it ain't done till you say I do. I'd be talking to some grooms after stuff like that and reminding them, it ain't done until you say I do. And you said what? I'm in, man. They need some help. You know, the term bridezilla is actually pretty new in our culture. It's only about 25 years old. But interestingly, it became one of the fastest words to be adopted into the Oxford English Dictionary. I mean, apparently the idea of a bridezilla isn't this rare aberration that they make a TV show about, but it's far more common than we think. And many would say that the advent of the bridezilla is evidence that we're making too much out of weddings. And, and I get that. I mean, there's money being spent, and there's social media influencers, and TV shows, and magazines, all this stuff about weddings. But I would actually challenge that that's not the case. I would actually challenge that the advent of the bridezilla is not because we're making too much of weddings, but because we're making too little of weddings. And I get this idea, believe it or not, from the book of the Song of Solomon. So if you have a Bible online at our physical services, North and South Campus Love, having everyone, get your Bible, turn to the Song of Solomon. We're going to be in the third chapter. If you don't have a Bible at our physical campuses underneath the chair in front of you, or underneath your chair is a black colored Bible, we're on page 561. If you're at our online campus, there's a little icon there. It looks like a book. It's actually a Bible. You can turn there as well. 
And what we have in chapter 3, we're going to look at the whole chapter. You're going to have to read all of it later. We can only look at parts of it today. What we have is Solomon's bride, she is remembering. Hear that. She is remembering parts of her wedding. And it says in verse 6, Who is this coming up from the desert like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh, incense made from all spices of all fragrances? Look, it's Solomon's carriage, escorted by, notice the phrase here, 60 warriors. We're coming back to that. The noblest of Israel. All of them are wearing um, a sword, all experienced in battle, each with a sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it of wood from Lebanon. Its posts are made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior lovingly inlaid by the daughters of Jerusalem. Come out, O daughters of Zion. And look at the king, Solomon, wearing the crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. I mean, let's be honest. We're only looking at a portion of the wedding. This was a big deal. This was like a royal kind of wedding. But she is remembering for a reason. Because the purpose of a wedding is not to be a one and done, an event in and of itself, but it's to call to mind the things we say during that wedding. See, what I think we have done in weddings is we have forgotten that there's something that we are saying that we want to increase day by day in our marriages. See, we've so focused on having the perfect wedding, the perfect event, that we've forgotten the very purpose of a wedding that ties into a marriage. You see, a wedding is a declaration of ongoing commitments. Most of us are familiar with the bad joke about the wife who told her husband, hey, you don't tell me you love me anymore. And he says, hey, I told you I loved you on the day we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. And we, eh. But far too often, that's the case when it comes to weddings, is it not? We see them as this big event. It's right there. It's about the event Instead of a memorial, a memorial to remind us that we said some things and every time we call it to remembrance, we're supposed to not just remember the things that we said, but to ask God to help us fulfill them in greater ways. And that's what Solomon's wife's doing. She's remembering what Solomon said to her. She's remembering what she said to Solomon. She's remembering these ongoing declarations of commitment. Like, there's a commitment we see in them to keep pursuing each other. In the ancient Hebrew culture, they did weddings a little bit differently. The first thing a groom would do is prepare a home for his bride. Once he got it ready, then he would then take his groomsmen, he would go to his fiance's house, he would escort her back to the house he had prepared for her. Anybody hearing images of Jesus coming back? Same words. He would go get her, bring them back, and they had the wedding ceremony. Well, we know that Solomon's fiance is from the village of Shunem, which is south of the Sea of Galilee. For us in Texas, it's not that far a drive. It'd be like Abilene to Arlington, a day trip. Only one problem in that day. No vehicles. In fact, most of the armies of that time would not have even had horses. There had been parts of them that had horses, but not all of them. Likely, the whole entourage that Solomon took was on foot, which means it would be a week up there and a week back. Remember, Solomon is the man, the king, literally. I'm not talking about wannabe kings of the household like we men talk about today. He was literally the king, and he could have just said, a man in his position to a woman in her position, especially in that day, you're going to come to me. Or he could have been real generous, sent his entourage. But Solomon took the road less traveled, and he actually went to her. He was telling his wife that he so values her that he will pursue her. Hear that word. See, I'm not sure there is a more important word for a priority relationship than the word pursue. To pursue is to seek to love someone the way they desire to be loved and not the way I want to be loved. See, I don't know if you know this yet, but I'm going to let you in on a secret. Men and women are different. You got men. We'll go men over here. Women over here. 
the way we approach things, the way we do things, and the way we receive love, absolutely different. Like the major ways a woman feels love. Guys, this is huge for you. I can make your life so much easier. If we get it, living is a little bit different. The basic needs of a woman makes a way. She wants security in her life. Security is more than just finances. It's about the priority of your relationship. She wants non-sexual affection. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next couple weeks, but just suffice it to say now, physical affection not going anywhere. Third, huge, open communication. Men speak in headlines. Women speak in footnotes. They want to know not just the highlights of your day, they want to know the details of your day, and they want to know how you felt while you went about these details of your day. Here's the problem. We men don't know how we feel. We're just like, I, I worked. I did my stuff. The average woman uses 25,000 words in a day. You know how many a man uses? 10,000. So by the time he gets home, he's done. All his words are used up if he's not careful. And so if you really want to love your wife, you've got to make sure you reserve some things for her. And number four, she wants spiritual leadership, meaning men, we take the lead. Husbands take the lead in our family pursuing Jesus. Hear me, if you ask God for the grace to love your wife in this way and you begin to do it, you will see a woman who feels very loved. Men, though, Ladies are radically different. In general, here's how men feel love. Number one is the word respect. In fact, write down Ephesians 5, 33 in the margins of your notes. Read it, and what you're going to find is that Paul substitutes the word respect for love when talking about a man. It's so synonymous that Paul would just say, husbands, you need to respect your wife. It doesn't mean you don't love them. That's just the way you love them. Number two is sex. By the way, number one, respect. Number two, sex, closely linked together. Again, we're going to hit it head on next week, appropriately, Valentine's weekend. You're going to want to be here. Number three, kindred fellowship. Men are boys at heart. They like to play. And something you can do is just find a way to do something with them that they enjoy. Now, you don't have to do it all. Like, my wife doesn't hunt with me. We tried it once. <laughs> and her need for open communication clash with my need for kindred fellowship because when you're hunting there seems to be a lot of empty space that you can have open communication but hear me ladies hunting is not the time for open communication and all the hunters said don't do it men just leave it right there just trust me so it doesn't mean you do everything but you know we did find one thing my wife um, wanted to go to the beach the thought of laying on a beach all day I mean I'd rather have my eyes poked out I needed something to do, so I decided I'd learn to scuba dive. And she actually learned to scuba dive with me. She was deathly afraid of it. And we make trips to this day where she will go scuba dive. She's overcome that now. It's great, and it means the world to me. And number four is domestic support, meaning she takes the lead. It doesn't mean she does, does everything. But she takes the lead in taking care of the household. You hear what I'm saying? The temptation of marriage is to quit pursuing once the wedding and the honeymoon occur. See, when we are dating, and if you weren't here last week when we talked about dating, you really won't need to get that message. But what we do when we're dating is we study the other person. We find out what they need, what they want, and we begin to serve those needs so that we can win their hearts. But once we're married, we begin to think, well, their hearts don't need to be won any longer. And so we, men and women, push aside the very principle that got us to the point of the wedding day, this idea of pursuit. The temptation of all priority relationships is to get to the point where we get distracted from pursuing that relationship to the level it needs. It happens with our two, our spouse. It can happen with our one. Jesus was talking to a church, church of Ephesus, great church. They only had one problem. You have forsaken your first love. What's the solution? Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Pursue like you did at first. What would it be like, just dream for a second, to have a husband that is pursuing radically after Jesus? Honoring him. And then from the anointing, the filling of the spirit that he gets, he would pursue his wife. He would ask God, how does my wife need to be loved? And he begins to show her love in that way. And at the same time, you have a wife pursuing Jesus, being filled with the spirit, 
and asking God for grace to love her husband in a way that he feels loved. What kind of marriages would we have? Would they not be the kind that the world will sit up and take notice and say we need what they have? Pursuit. But that's not the only thing that this lady remembered. We also know at the wedding that they declared, I commit to always provide my best. If you look back at verse 6, you can see that Solomon put his best foot forward. Not just at the wedding, but just getting her. Remember, he's been traveling on foot for probably six days. It's dirty, it's nasty, but he takes some time before he gets there to make sure that he's got everything set up. He is dressed to the nines. He smells good. He came prepared. And in verse 10, you see, he came ready to pick her up. He had a ride, man. Silver and gold, he had a carriage made just for her. He was showing her, hey, I'm ready to provide for you and for your needs. And in chapter 4, we'll talk about next week, she says the exact same thing. Now, Hear me, I recognize most of us, even in the prosperous old good old USA, we don't have the physical resources Solomon had. Most of us can't build a gold chariot. I get that. But I want to challenge that maybe the primary way we show our spouse to be that we are willing to provide the best for them isn't in the physical things. Maybe it's not in the size of the ring we buy or the car we drive or the first home we buy. But you know what? We can tell them, I am ready for you by walking wisely before we're married. I mean, come on. We can work hard at school. We can work hard at our jobs and show them that we are going to live a life where we strive for excellence in all that we do. We can handle money wisely so that we don't bring unnecessary financial problems into a marriage. We can be radical and actually have some savings that we bring into a wedding. See, so many times when we're single, we think singles can be a great excuse for unwise living. Like, if I do something stupid, if I do something dumb, doesn't matter, all it affects is me. Not true. One, there's a Father in heaven who longs for you to have the very best, and every time we don't walk in the best that he has for us, it hurts his heart. But more than that, there are decisions that you can make today that are unwise, foolish, stupid, And the effects of those can last not days or months, but years and years. And you can go into a marriage and the effects of your unwise living years ago, you drag into that marriage and such. See, we can actually, when we're single, we can press in the Lord, deal with the stuff of our life. People are getting married later and later in life. I get that. I'm a fan of younger marriage if you find the two in your life and you know that's who it is. But if you get married later, hey, take advantage of the time. Deal with the stuff of your heart as much as you possibly can. Go to the places where Jesus can bring healing to your heart. Go after it. See, we need to be a people who are in growing in wisdom. We're talking about the application of the principles of God into our day-to-day life. I mean, what better way can you show your potential spouse, your fiance, hey, I'm ready for you. I have been building my life in a way to be ready for you through wise living all these years and such. Now, some of you begin to think, well, dude, if I have to do that, I'll never get married. Do I have to have it all together? Does anyone, I guess other people have it all together when they get married? I did, but probably the rest of you are not. (laughs) Come on. I mean, we know reality to that. Of course we're still going to need to grow in wisdom. But if you have a track record that says I'm willing to grow in wisdom... And you have that day where you say, I commit to do all I can to provide my very very best. And you continue to be a person who will grow in the wisdom of the Lord. Man, what a marriage that we can have. Part of what we need is in both spouses a willingness, an ongoing willingness to grow in wisdom that's going to bless your entire household. See, if you pursue, you provide your best. And then actually, she remembers a third thing. I commit to do what I can to protect our relationship. Did you notice wedding, Solomon's wedding party? Remember the number I told you to look at? 60. Not just any 60. These were the Navy SEALs of the Israeli army. They were the special forces. They were the Green Beret, whatever you want to call them. And so what he's doing is, I'm going on a week-long journey to get her. I'm bringing her on a week-long journey back. If someone attacks us, we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready to protect. I'm not just going to go get her. I'm going to be ready to protect her from the onslaught of a potential enemy. 
See, I would challenge that our home, our marriage, should be growing into the safest and most encouraging place in human existence. Our commitment to one another should be so deep that we are always seeking to protect our spouse from the onslaught of the enemy, which means we get up in the morning, we're praying, we're praying for our spouse, we're praying for covering, we're praying against the attacks the enemy would want to bring on our house. We watch our words. We know there will be times to criticize, but we want to make sure our encouraging words are far, far, far more than our critical words. We don't criticize or demean or correct our spouse in front of others. We do it in a private place. We are our spouse's greatest champion, our spouse's greatest cheerleader. We learn to handle conflict. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. We're quick to apologize, quick to seek forgiveness, quick to give forgiveness when our spouse does something that they should not do. And above everything else, we communicate this. I'm not going away. I'm not going away. In the first three verses of chapter 3, we see a fear in the heart of Solomon's wife. Most commentators believe this didn't actually happen. Though some challenge it actually did. Because Solomon chose foolish decisions later on, and we hope he repented towards the end of his life. But most believe it was just a nightmare she had. Verse 1, all night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchman found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? See, I think we get the gist of this. This lady fears that one day she's going to wake up and Solomon's going to be gone, that the bed beside her is going to be empty. And I think we all understand this as both men and women. You know, people are waiting longer to get married. Like the average age for a young lady is 27, 28 years old to get married. Men, it's into their 30s now. And one of the reasons, not the only reason, is a hesitation because they've seen the struggle of marriages. They've walked in their families through the pain of divorce or seen it in their friends. It is why some couples choose to live together. Even though that's contrary to God's will, we think we need to try it out and make sure it works before we really dive into something. Interestingly, studies show that people get married are far happier, have far better sex, uh, have long, greater longevity in their relationship than those who live together. Look that up. Even more, when you choose to live together, you're almost guaranteeing yourself a place of something like divorce. One-sixth of couples, only one-sixth of couples that lived together last more than three years. Only one-tenth, 10% last more than five years. But even when we do marry, the fear still pops up. Tell me, let me tell you one of the greatest gifts you can give to your spouse. We don't mention the D word. We don't say divorce. Not an option. Now, I understand the Bible has some cases where it's allowed, But it doesn't have to occur. Even in the most difficult of situations, we can walk through those circumstances with repentance and restoration. My wife and I were married, not old, but young. Barely 19 years old when I got married. We had our fair share of conflicts. Both of us driven, both of us strong-willed. We still have them, just not as often. To this day, my wife has never suggested, never hinted at the idea of divorce. Death has been suggested, No talk of divorce. And I, I, I've never done I've done the same thing. We only have two options in our marriage, happy or unhappy. And we want the unhappy to be so miserable that it moves us to the repentance necessary to get to happy. And that place of commitment, our protection against the greatest fear in marriage, gives us a place where we can grow, challenges us to grow. We can help one another in the Lord. See, one of the greatest things you can do, I'm going to say it again, You can do for your marriage is rid yourself and your vocabulary and your mindset of the D word. Now, if you've been divorced, listen to me. You know why I'm saying this. I don't think I have walked with people through anything that is as painful as divorce. Even in the most legitimate of circumstances. See, I understand. We're in some situations right now where one spouse really, really wants to save their marriage and the other just says no. I mean, there's a time that you just can't do anything about it. It still hurts. It is still painful, miserably painful. That's why God hates it. He doesn't hate people who get divorced. He hates divorce because of the pain it does to those that he loves. 
See, I want you to know there's healing. There's forgiveness for divorce. There are times you can't do anything about it. But in your marriage, if you're saying, I want to have the kind of marriage that reflects the love of God, we rid our vocabulary, we rid our mindset of this. If it's a word you're using often, if it's a threat that you're sending out there, repent. And repent means what you were doing, you don't do anymore. And you get rid of that. Find another way to deal with your conflict. If it's that serious, get some help. Nothing wrong with that at all. Wow, there's so much counsel been spoken in my life, I can't even tell you that. But one thing you can do, we have it here, one of the best tools you can use to get some help, call it re-engage. You can join a re-engage group if you want a stronger marriage. You say, I want to get better at it. Join a re-engage group. We go all these principles I'm talking about on a far deeper level. If you're wrestling in your marriage, we've seen God do some tremendous work. You, will you be challenged? Oh, to the core of your being, you will be challenged. To become the man or woman of God that you're supposed to become so you can be the husband or wife of God that you're supposed to be. The good news about re-engage, you can start any week. It's Wednesday nights. We host it during COVID season, South Campus only. It's going to be 6.15 p.m. this Wednesday night. You just go to the chapel-looking building that's at the front of our property at the South Campus. People there will direct you. I put on your notes our website about it. You can learn about it. You can look at it. All that kind of stuff. I challenge you. Invest in your marriage and see what God does. So here's what I want us to do. South Campus, North Campus, people online, everyone listening in who's not driving, bow your heads for a moment. I just want you to close your eyes. And I want us to go on a journey for a few minutes here. We're not going to linger here long. But we're going to take a second. If you're married, I want you to remember your wedding ceremony. Because you made some promises that day. I, David, take you to Jeanette. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death only shall separate us. I make this covenant to you, my wife, by God's grace and for God's glory. Words like that I spoke. They weren't words just meant for that day. They were words that were meant to be fulfilled in a deeper way 35 years later when we're at this place. Every one of you who are married spoke those words at some level. I've done a lot of wedding ceremonies, and I don't know of anyone who just really didn't mean it. I never did a wedding ceremony where someone didn't repeat those words. At some level, mean they were going to do that. But then we find out we didn't think for worse. We just thought for better. And we need grace for worse. If you're single, you say, man, I haven't gone through wedding. Just begin to think for a moment about what your wedding ceremony might be like, the things you're going to say. It's okay. Because are you doing the things necessary to help be in the best place possible for those commitments? See, we all made the promise to pursue. We all made a declaration to provide, to protect. But let's be honest, we can all get distracted or get out of bounds. Would you ask the Lord just to begin to show you right now? Show you how you're doing. Just hear the word pursue. Hear the word provide. Hear the word protect. Are we doing those things? We can go deeper. We can be better. Some of us have gone a long way from them. If that's you, remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Just ask the Lord for grace, for courage. Some of us need to take some big steps. See, one of the reasons we're doing the prayer night this Wednesday night, the counter. I mean, our nation needs prayer. Our marriages need prayer. We've been through a lot of difficulty, and we know as a church we need to gather and just cry out to God. I want you to be here Wednesday night, online or in person at the South Campus. But right now, if you are married, would you renew your commitment to pursue your spouse in the way they need to be pursued? Come on, would you just renew it before the Lord right now? Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, the scripture says. Men, ask the Lord for grace to love your wife as Christ loved the church. In the same way, wives, you are to respect your husband in all things. Women, ask for this grace. Let's love in the way. Let's renew it. Let's ask God for grace. Ask God to, for grace to provide the best, to walk in wisdom. If you're not married yet, the decisions you make today will affect the marriage you are going to have. 95% of you will be married. Walk in that wisdom. Ask God for a download of wisdom to live by the principles of God in our day-to-day -day life. Some of us need to renew our commitment to that. 
Would you ask for grace for that? Courage. Would you commit to protect your marriage? If you have been using the D word, using it as a threat, I charge you, I challenge you, get rid of it. Have it disappear. If there's some struggles, then make a commitment and say, we're going to do what we can to work on this. We're going to go to counsel. We're going to go to re-engage. We're going to do something, but we're going to make a go of this. We made covenant with each other. And I just think the Lord is going to give grace. Some of us are in unhappy places. And we think the answer to unhappy is to get out. I'm going to challenge that maybe the answer to unhappy is to repent and to begin to become together who we're supposed to be. Father, we remember the day we were wed. Some of us looking forward to the day we will wed. And we know we made commitments that day, Lord. Let us remember those things. It's a memorial. And we ask to build upon that memorial. And each day we live together, we ask for grace to fulfill our commitments in greater ways possible. Anoint us by the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen.